everyone in this episode we focus on india's strategic security position we explore india's tense border clashes with china while offering insights into china's historical mindset towards india we also discuss the various dimensions of our relationship with pakistan this episode features special appearances by lieutenant general dipendra singh huda and lieutenant general sayed hasnain who provide first hand accounts of the ground realities at the border we also examine india's efforts to strengthen its defense capabilities through indigenous defense production and infrastructure development in the northeastern states these initiatives are pivotal in building robust armed forces and addressing internal insurgencies join us as we navigate the complexities of india's security challenges and strategies revealing how past conflicts and proactive measures are shaping india's role on the global stage undoubtedly china has been the biggest challenge to the uh, modi government in managing international relations in the light of your comment uh, understand the chinese mindset to reset relations what is your assessment of what has gone right and what has gone wrong uh, in india's relationship with china china has long pursued comprehensive containment military economic and diplomatic containment to prevent india's rise as a peer competitor china wants a sinocentric unipolar asia uh, as one old chinese saying goes um, uh, there cannot be two suns in the sky there cannot be two tigers uh, on a mountain india was wrong in pinning its hopes on china abiding by its written commitments and on moshi Uh, Moshi on Modi Xi Bon Homi. The Chinese leaders see world politics in much the same way as they see domestic politics. Ni se wo huo. I live, you die. A life and death struggle. A zero sum game characterized by rivalries, conflicts, deceit. shifting alliances and betrayals in this world view treaties norms bilateral agreements friendships commitments do not count for china power trumps law that is why you see a number of agreements you know treaties and agreements are signed by the chinese to buy time to gain time until correlation of forces shifts in peking's favor in terms of what's gone what's gone well i think the trade relationship is seen as beneficial but a lot of things have also gone wrong uh, for example when prime minister modi first came to power his approach to china was that you know he when he was chief minister of gujarat he visited china multiple times and and he was very fond of uh, china's development he talked very positively about learning from china and he was impressed by china's infrastructure development so when he became prime minister he did attempt to you know improve relations perhaps even try to solve the border problem and you may remember one of the one of the more lasting images of india china relations is prime minister modi and prime minister and president xi jinping sitting on a swing on a jhula on the banks of the sabarmati river during xi jinping's visit to india so in terms of images in in terms of you know uh, diplomatic images that is perhaps the closest we can get to a good relationship and prime minister modi attempted perhaps misguidedly in my view uh, to develop this close relationship with president xi jinping india's approach overall uh, since particularly the 2020 border clash has been has been good i think uh, prime minister modi and foreign minister jashankar uh, the way they have responded to you know the 2020 clashes and the situation on the border after that has been good in the sense that they have said that look the situation is not normal the situation on the line of actual control is not normal until there is a resolution of this issue 
that our relations with China will not be normal. Entire world has not only taken note of it, they have also taken note of the fact that since then we have stood firm. Our diplomacy has backed up our deployment. China and India, two giants of Asia. Uh, I don't, you see, China is first of all completely Pacific oriented. India is completely oriented towards the Indian Ocean. So geographically, while we are conjoined at the on the Himalayas, we have totally different avenues, different sides. The Chinese, civilizationally, as rich as India, both are civilizationally, you know, tigers and lions of the world. It is obvious that that kind of a competition comes in. But the competition should only come if there are perceptions of threat. Otherwise, both sides can work together to ensure that both the people ultimately benefit from our cooperation. That cooperation, that element of trust is missing. And is more on the part of China, I'll say, because obviously as an Indian, I feel that. More on the part of China. No one, China can, has never been able to decide, is it a friend of India? Is it an adversary of India? Is it a collaborator of the India? Is it a partner of India? They've never been there. They've treated uh, the relationship differently at different times. Case of uh, continuing between the Indian and Chinese troops in Chumar, uh, this goes beyond an intrusion by the PLA. About 100 troops are lined up on either side. Uh, now, you were the army commander during the Chumar incident along the uh, uh, LAC in 2014. Uh, what were the key lessons learned from that encounter? Because I think that was the kind of uh, genesis of the recent problem. So let me just briefly describe uh on what happened so it was uh, in september that suddenly we saw about 500 chinese soldiers uh, along with uh, you know they came with some earth moving and road construction equipment and tried to build a road on our side of the uh, line of actual control and the minute we saw this uh, you know, the local post commander there immediately reacted. Uh, he stopped the dozers from coming inside. And we quickly built up our, our forces. And, you know, then there were thousands of soldiers facing off each other at a distance of maybe one or two yards. And the situation carried on, you know, over the next two weeks. Uh, what lesson we learned, uh, one is that you need to stand firm uh, against the Chinese. This was the time, and I, I, I think it's important also to put this in context. This was the time when uh, we had these very massive floods uh, in the Kashmir Valley. So the road coming from Srinagar to uh, Ladakh lay was completely cut off. And this is the main sort of uh, road for movement into, into Leh and Ladakh. So we were, Leh was completely sort of cut off from, from Srinagar side. And Xi Jinping was to visit uh, India in the next two days. So maybe, you know, I, I can't say, but uh, my own sense is, uh, you know, the PLA thought this is an opportune time. That they can't bring in too many reinforcements and the fact that there's a high level political meeting which is due. Uh, perhaps the Indian army will not respond very strongly and, you know, accept this. So. One lesson is, you know, you need to stand completely, completely firm with uh, whatever do it, they do. Okay. So in, 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 in that context, uh, is it fair to say that uh, uh, India giving shelter to Dalai Lama, uh, you know, basically made China go berserk? Uh, do you think India needs to do any course correction vis-a-vis uh, -vis Dalai Lama? Tezpur, in the northeast of India, has become known all over the world, for it was here that India received the Dalai Lama after his flight from Tibet. India offered the God King of Buddhism a safe refuge from the Communist Chinese. To Tezpur flocked reporters representing the press of all the free world. By jeeps, the God King and his entourage travelled the last stage of their perilous 300-mile journey. 
No one could have told from his unruffled bearing as he was greeted by high Indian officials and presented with the white scarf, token of friendship, that the Dalai Lama had been in mortal danger since he left Lhasa. The 23-year-old spiritual head of the 500 million Buddhists throughout the Far East confirmed that he had been forced to leave his capital. Well, I don't think that uh, um, uh, India-China relations worsened uh, uh, because India gave shelter to the Dalai Lama. That is one reason, one factor, not the only factor. You have to understand that China and India relations would be adversarial even if India had not given shelter to the Dalai Lama. China is, is not just another nation state. China is an empire state. Chinese history textbooks, I studied Chinese history in China in the early 80s. Chinese history textbooks teach strength leads to expansion and weakness to contraction. Historically, a prosperous and powerful China always engaged in territorial expansion, assimilation, and subjugation of its periphery. To protect the core of Han China, successive dynasties sought to establish buffer states, tributaries on its periphery. So, in China wants its neighbors to be respectful, impotent, and weak. China would prefer small, weak, subordinate states on its peripheries, and it distrusts strong, big, powerful states. This is the first time in history you have two Asian giants rising economically, militarily, becoming more powerful, and competing with each other in the same continent with disputed boundaries, in this and carving out sphere of influence. Before that, before 2003, India's position on Tibet was open to interpretation. But in 2003, when Prime Minister Vajpayee went to China, he wanted his visit to be seen as a success. And right at the end of his visit, he was kind of tricked into a situation where he signed on to a statement where India explicitly recognized Tibet as part of of People's Republic of China. So we have to understand that uh, Tibet has been a key factor in um, a Sino-Indian relationship. China remains very suspicious of uh, India in terms of you know how India uses the Tibet card. And, and certainly in terms of uh, diplomatic games, uh, Dalai Lama's presence in India, while it complicates situation for India in terms of you know Sino-Indian relations, but it also does give India a, a very important diplomatic card. Okay. Now, if if that is the problem that uh, uh, you know uh, India has ceded territory to China, what would be the approach that the opposition, which keeps alleging that we have ceded territory, would adopt? Um, you know, in case the opposition comes to power, uh, in this kind of a delicate situation. What would the opposition do or what would any other alternative be by any other government? If India is to contend with China, the only way to contend with China really is to, to develop its economy so that the gap between China and India narrows and narrows considerably. You know, as Bill Clinton used to say, it's the economy stupid. You know, the economy has to be the focus. Keep a low profile. Keep a low profile. Develop your economy. Once your economy is stronger, you can also modernize in military. If you have a bigger economy, you'll have a bigger military, a more modern military. If you have a stronger industrial base, you will have a stronger military industrial base also. And you'll be a much bigger power. Look, um, we've done our utmost to engage China. China is the country that has carried out its um, uh, policy of pressure, and um, intimidation, we can even say, uh, first in the India-Bhutan-China uh, trijunction and then in Ladakh. And we've engaged with China. Uh, is that we have taken a position of reasonableness, of um, multipolarity, if I may call it that, that we will engage with China. But we are not out there to, to uh, isolate China. What we need is 
cool conversations, patience and persistence. And I think we are doing this. So I have nothing special on which I would fault the government in terms of its uh, dealings with China. Okay. Now, in one of your articles in The Diplomat, you wrote that both China and India aspire to the same things at the same time on the same continental landmass uh, and its uh, uh, adjoining waters. You are also said that the Chinese censors encourage alarmingly frank discussion of the merits of another war against India. If a war indeed breaks out between India and China, how do you think it will pan out in your view, considering especially that China has had no direct combat experience in the past 40 odd years or so? In China's future vision of Pax Sinica, India is a total misfit. China sees uh, India as a spoiler state, backed by the US, Japan and others, seeking to sabotage Xi's China dream and trying to overturn the pro-China balance of power that prevails in South Asia. So that provides a reason for territorial disputes that um, uh, have become very, you know, uh, dominant. Uh, they have long been dormant um, in the past. They are symbolic of uh, the competition between China and India. There is a cold war that's going on between China and India um, at the regional level. At the global level, the cold war is between China and the U.S. So China sees India as a, as a growing and ambitious power quoted by the West with whom China will have to have a day of reckoning. The question is when, not if. Believing the U.S. is in decline, China is laying down new markers, drawing new lines all around its periphery in the land, water, air, sand, and snow. China uses cartography to assert and project power in its region. Because as clean as this map looks, within it, there's actually a lot going on. Border tug of wars, fake islands, a 10th dash on a line in the ocean, barbed wire wrapped clubs, and proxy wars. It's the perfect example of how maps aren't just maps. They're tools of national power. Snow, And that's why the possibility of conflict between China in some form is um, much greater than it was in the past. The 1962 war was a clear win for China. But I believe the next Sino-Indian war is likely to be a stalemate. The only wild card in this equation are nuclear weapons. The threatened use of nuclear weapons could bring an end to this conflict. Mm -hmm. Now, there is no doubt that uh, militarily and economically, India, uh, so China is far, far ahead uh, of India. But when it comes to warfare, it's not necessarily your technological might that matters, which we know from our experience with Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq. Um, it's not just the military strength, it's boots on the ground and what happens on the day-to-day -day basis on the battleground. Uh, considering that India has tremendous experience uh, in uh, managing its borders at very high uh, altitudes like CHN Glacier, uh, do you think China will fall short and give competitive advantage to India as far as direct combat experience at high altitude is concerned? China may not uh, have a battle uh, at trained, um, battle-tested uh, military as India has, but China has an advantage over India in terms of uh, weaponry, uh, technology, and numbers. China already has the largest navy in the world. Uh, numbers may not matter in uh, wartime because the quality of weapons, quality of weapons technology and tactics come into play. These are decisive. Uh, in determining the outcome of conflicts, technology and tactics. But uh, uh, in peacetime, of course, uh, uh, numbers do change perceptions. 
about the changing shift in the balance of power and in changing alignments, relationships. So uh, China has played the numbers game to its advantage uh, in that sense. But um, uh, you, uh, I, I would, as I said before, um, uh, India may have a battle-tested uh, uh, military and China may not uh, have gone to war in a direct combat uh, uh, since 1979. Uh, but Chinese military is a formidable uh, machine. There is no guarantee of the winnability of war if China decides to go to war with India. <coughs> and if even if there's a stalemate on the Himalayan front, I tell you, the world will take India as the victor and not China. China doesn't even have the experience. After 1979, they haven't fought a war anywhere. The troops are not experienced. What you're seeing is only on video screens, tremendous projection of the fighting which takes place in Tibet or in other parts of China. It's all projection. China is using information warfare to fight its wars. Cognitive warfare. The three warfare strategy of 2003, legal warfare, media warfare, cyber warfare. Right? So these are the things which are now, unfortunately, because of that, this little tiff takes place, standoffs take place in the dark from time to time. And one of the important things we have to remember is till today in 21 or 22 meetings that we have had since 1993 uh, on the about the line of actual control, China has not acceded to our demand that they provide us with one map, marked map of their perception of the line of actual control. They have not given us. Why? Because they want this problem to persist forever until they feel the asymmetry between India and China will be so high that India cannot at all ever interfere in the maritime zone. But I don't think that time will come. You know, you're right that uh, you're right that the Chinese military, in terms of its equipment, in terms of technology, uh, is uh, is better than what what India has. They even have sort of better infrastructure uh, on on their side. Uh, but the fact, Mohan, is you're find, fighting at altitudes, uh, you know, which are 15, 16, 17,000 feet. You're fighting on the Himalayan watershed, which is the highest mountain range in the world. So, uh, you know, this is on what, uh, what machines and technology can do. And a lot will depend on, uh, you know, what sort of soldiers there are. And then you, you mentioned, as I said, I don't want to say that the soldiers are not professional, but there are there are issues. So uh, there is there is con conscription system. So there are conscripts. You talked about a one child policy. Uh, also, what uh, and this is this is from some research uh, that has been done that uh, the PLA is not really getting the best of the people because <clears throat> you know uh, because population is shrinking, people are looking for better opportunities rather than going into the PLA. And our soldiers, as I mentioned uh, before, are battle-hardened, have experienced the kind of conditions that exist. Some of the senior lot which would be there in units uh, would perhaps have seen these conditions maybe two or three times. I mean, I myself in the first sort of 20 years of my service, I had served uh, on the UP Tibet border uh, against China. I had served in Sikkim. I had served in Nagaland. So, you know, the conditions under which we operate make you actually much better equipped to handle handle these situations. When we talk about India and Pakistan. Kashmir becomes front and center. Uh, the new Prime Minister uh, of Pakistan has also talked about uh, Kashmir in his very first address. Uh, with all the issues that are confronting Pakistan at the moment, why Kashmir still occupies front and center in terms of uh, the strategic priorities of the Pakistani leaders? Coming to your question specifically, why is Pakistan emphasizing Kashmir at a time when it's in such distress? And my answer is, it's pretty foolish to do that. Let Kashmir lie as an issue. There's not going to be a resolution by using force. Pakistan has tried thrice 
1965, and then Cargill in 1999, and it didn't work. So let's uh, come to an understanding with India that uh, this is an issue that um, can be left dormant. And so let's now focus upon trade, on uh, letting people go from one side of the border to the other and become normy, normal, friendly countries. Or if not friendly, at least learn to live together decently. Mm -hmm. Now, the fact that Pakistan does not do that is, of course, because of its army. The army has to have a raison d'etre. And what better than to say that we have a perpetual enemy on our borders? But that's not going to work for too long. It, too, now has started, I'd say, backpedaling a little bit. So just to give you an example, at Islamabad airport and at various um, uh, important intersections in the city, there used to be neon signs of how many days since Article 370 was abrogated and um, the the minutes and the hours from that time on, well, they disappeared. So it'll... The, the realization will come that uh, we cannot keep doing what we have done for the last 76 years. I'm hopeful. I think that this is, this is a narrative that has been um, put out there by the Pakistani security establishment uh, for, for many years tied to this notion of a, of a, of a, um, a continuously uncompromisingly hostile relationship with it, with India that is threatening to Pakistan's interests. And so it connects India's policies in Kashmir to this notion of India posing this threat, even an existential threat to Pakistan. Any political party worth its salt in Pakistan is going to take the same position on Kashmir. It would be, I think, tantamount to political suicide to have a political party, a political leader say, well, let's forget about Kashmir, let's move on from it. What sort of a mindset would lay siege to 8 million people with 900,000 troops? Women, children, sick people, locked in as animals. Of what I know of England, if 8 million animals were locked in, the RSPCA would have made a lot of noise about it. These are human beings. What is going to happen when the curfew is lifted will be a bloodbath. The people will come out. There are 900,000 troops there. These 900,000 troops, what are they going to do? Uh, and uh, as far as India is concerned, Kashmir has been uh, you know, a war theater for a long time uh, and has simmered uh, you know, for so long, resulting in the deaths of you know, hundreds and thousands of uh, Indian, Indian soldiers. And, um, but now, with the abrogation of Article 370, uh, which was seen as a, uh, uh, you know, either a massive victory or a massive disaster, but now we see, at least on the surface, that peace has returned and prosperity uh, uh, is, is returning as well to Kashmir. So, in the light of your experience, could you please enlighten us what's happened in the Kashmir in the last 10, 15 years? To put your question into the right context here, we are looking at the progression in Kashmir over the last 10, 15, 20 years. And whether we have resolved the problem today, I would start with that and say, no, we have not resolved the problem. We have stabilized Kashmir. To a very great extent, we have stabilized Kashmir through the uh, strategy, the approach which uh, uh, Mr. Modi's government has followed. Right, But we are not out of the woods. Uh, and that's a cautionary which I always give to everyone because there's no point me having the experience and then not being transparent and not being upfront in giving that advice. We've got a long way to go still because Pakistan is still there. The separatists are still there. The terrorist leadership is still there. None of it has disappeared. It's all that is still there. Hmm. What we have achieved is we have taken apart all the networks 
which are mm-hmm. an inevitable part of this kind of warfare. We have taken apart the overground warfare networks. We have taken apart the financial networks to a great extent, which supports proxy war. And 2019 was a very bold decision. Uh, we could have we could have continued with that situation for the next 10 years and said we will take our decisions when the time comes. No. We took that decision on 5th of August very correctly and with a lot of preparatory work behind it. And that has led to the current success where you're finding suddenly the narratives are changing. It's now a development narrative. It's an economic narrative. It's an education narrative. It's a youth-based narrative, a women's narrative. All this is working very positively, converging together. We have to just keep energizing this. And I hope mm-hmm. that the uh, Lok Sabha elections, the first indicators will be there of uh, how well uh, democracy works in Kashmir. Thereafter, by September, as the Supreme Court has given out, I'm sure the assembly elections will take place. And then we will have to take our decisions as to how to take this forward. Right at this Lal Chowk, where there used to be protests and violence around it, lockdown or hartal or shutdown or a curfew-like situation, today reconstructed and renovated under that Smart City project. It has been inaugurated in 2023, but perhaps a reflection that there is a new Kashmir to look at of hope, peace and change. And perhaps this reconstructed Lal Chowk will be able to witness only the good times here on. All right. Now, in, in, in one sense, it's, it's beautiful that there is a separation of power between uh, the pol- politics and military. But in another sense, whether it is dealing with external aggression or internal dissension, it is absolutely critical that uh, the political leaders and the military leaders need to dance together. Um, in fact, uh, you know, uh, you know, you are you are you are the uh, uh, architect of the heart doctrine, and uh, uh, you know, uh, obviously, you know it more than anybody else. That uh, uh, you know, political solution is uh, more critical than military solution to any conflict. Uh, but uh, that said, um, you know, uh, how important is the political resolve uh, in guiding the defense forces? The reason I'm asking this question is. Coming from a common man's perspective, you know, we have heard saying that, uh, you know, Kashmir problem remained, uh, uh, you know, unresolved for lack of political will. Uh, and, uh, you know, many times, you know, uh, uh, army would catch uh, a militant sacrificing several lives and the political leaders would uh, release those militants. You know, if, if you look at it from the common man's perspective, they hear these different versions and say, well, you know, where the tension is coming from. So. My question to you, sir, is how important is political leadership in uh, 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 working with and guiding the defense forces? A very well put together question, I must say. And, I, and, and I, my immediate response would be, uh, in a country like ours, where we have a liberal democracy, uh, political guidance, uh, um, political understanding of national security is of immense importance. A lot of people have a misnomer, a mistake, a mistaken impression that the political community in India does not understand national security. I would disagree with it. The way Mr. Modi in 2014, after coming to power, decided, for example, to test Pakistan, to test them out with the offers of friendship. And you saw what happened finally in 2015, early 16, with the Pathan court attack. That confirmed very clearly that Pakistan would not respond to Mr. Modi's overtures. And the message went very clearly, from now on, we will make the efforts differently. And you saw with the removal of Article 370, with the responses that we made through surgical strikes, through the Balakot strike, etc., the messaging became very clear. I think the political messaging in all this was absolutely outstanding. It helped the army hugely to control the situation in Jammu and not lose out. The last part of this, I've always, you mentioned the Hart's Doctrine. I I always consider that this is a all of government, all all departments, all of society approach, which has to be used in the situation, such as Jammu and Kashmir. I think no one has understood it better than Mr. Modi and his government. Now, for 
by putting uh, Mr. Manoj Sinha there and his outreach to the people, gingering up all departments to do what only the army was doing earlier. That has made all the difference. So political military understanding, political military uh, strategizing and coordinating together is an evolving thing. It has happened over a time. We've learned our lessons. We are still making mistakes. We will overcome those mistakes in the future. So uh, during critical times, uh, Mohan, uh, we have seen a great clarity on, on the political side to uh, the directions that they gave. I mean, uh, look at the 71 war, for example. Uh, Kargil, I know there is some criticism about uh, instructions given not to cross the the line of control to the Indian forces, uh, but that was a clear, clear decision taken by the political object, uh, by the political leadership. Now you could criticize it or not, but there was clarity in what they wanted and uh, how the military should behave. Uh, there was great clarity uh, when I was tasked for the 2016 surgical strike. That uh, clear directions, not uh, in exactly how you should do it but what we want from this and what is it that we aim to sort of achieve uh, by this. So I think in times of crisis, there is great clarity. If there is uh, uh, a criticism, it is that there is not enough political military uh, discussion and debate uh, in normal times on you know how we need to look at uh, the overall direction of our national security. Uh, how is it that capability development must uh, must happen within the within the military? That I think is something that's uh, that's lacking. Um, so let's shift uh, uh, gear now and and talk about uh, war uh, tactics. Now, for common man, you know, we sit in the comfort of our lounge and uh, you know watch a movie on Bollywood or Hollywood uh, about war, and it's pretty exciting. But for people like you, you know, who who is on the ground fighting the war, putting your uh, life at risk, is a totally different uh, scenario uh, altogether. Uh, when we when it comes to the art of modern warfare, uh, and if you were to pinpoint certain paradigms uh, in two three periods or whatever, how would you how would you do that, sir? You see, this is, it's all about as I said, it's all about progression. It's an all about progression of. Human aspects, human values, politics, and a lot to do with technologies. Uh, wars before the 80s were primarily in the conventional domain. Uh, and I think the best examples of it are uh, 1965 between India and Pakistan, 1967, the, in, uh, the Arab Israeli conflict, uh, the Sinai conflict, if you remember, 1973, the Yom Kippur War. It was national resources, the uh, armed forces put together and all their implements against the forces of the other country. And it depended on who, what was the outcome and who was the best. These were generally shot in nature, 10 days, 14 days, 20 days. And the outcome mm -hmm. was very clear, victory or defeat. As you saw in mm -hmm. 71, as you saw in six, uh, 67, as you saw in 73. Somewhere, mm -hmm. down, somewhere down the line, these things changed after 1980, particularly mm -hmm. the time when the Russians came into, uh, into Afghanistan. And that was the first, the nascent period where hybrid war started coming into being. Where you found uh, conventional weapons, kinetic weapons were used. Uh, at the same time, it was important. Uh, you found there were, the, the lines got blurred. There, were no, there was no rear, there was no flank, there was no front. Everywhere the adversary could be, right? There were no demarcated lines, and on top of that, the rules of war started changing, right? Uh, otherwise, there were very clear cut rules of war earlier. In fact, even the earlier times, there used to be rules of war to say no fighting at night. People actually withdrew after six o'clock, relaxed, and came back to fight the next morning. But all that, of course, has changed. Uh, hybrid war, particularly after 9 11. When the Americans went into Afghanistan, and prior to that, the Gulf War I and Gulf War II changed things a lot. Lots and lots of new technologies started coming in. Uh, information warfare started becoming very, very important. Space-based warfare, the taking down of uh, satellites of other countries and things like that. 
this became very important. Uh, something like Jammu and Kashmir, which has gone on for the better part of 35 years, uh, hybridity, which included the violent aspect of terrorism, but at the same time included ideological aspects to change the minds of the population, right? To bring in a financial conduits, drugs, drug cartels. All this has become a part of warfare today. The internet has changed things drastically. The information world. After all, if you remember, ISIS in 2014 when it came and suddenly jumped into importance. How ISIS controlled the minds of so many young people in the West. 40,000 well-to-do people from the Western world entered into northern Iraq to fight on behalf of ISIS against their own countries and against their own organizations. So this is the changing nature of war. You cannot put your finger to it and say, this is it, it's going to remain like this. No. Every day brings a change in warfare. So one, I think the biggest sort of uh, impact on what we call the character of warfare uh, has been technology. I mean, today we are seeing much more sort of precise and precision in firing. Uh, we are seeing long range, uh, you know, vectors and weapons uh, being used. I mean, Iran and Israel are targeting each other from uh, 1,000 miles away. You are seeing Ukrainian drones uh, hitting Moscow. So what we used to say that, you know, the front lines are largely where two militaries face each other. Today, that is no longer the case. I mean, there is a war from afar. So even <clears throat> civilian populations, which are not in the sort of direct contact, uh, are also are also in, in danger. We are seeing new challenges in the space of cyber, uh, information warfare. Today, we say control is not only over territories, uh, but we also need to have control over public opinion. And that's how information uh, warfare has has transformed you know the very the very character of war. We are also seeing some uh, precision uh, high technology weapon systems in the hands of non state actors. So the Houthis have been striking you know uh, the Aramco oil facilities in in Saudi Arabia, and so are thinking about uh, how do you deter adversaries has also undergone a change and we need to start rethinking uh, deterrence against state actors is one aspect. Uh, how do you deter non-state actors? So a lot of uh, changes not only in tactics on the battlefield but also in our fundamental thinking about warfare are, are undergoing a change. At the same time, some things have remained constant, Mohan, and those things are that uh, human resources are still key in, in war fighting. You know, I think a, a British general very famously said, look, you can't cyber your way across a river. And how is success being measured? Success is still being measured in territorial terms about land captured. So Ukraine says, oh, we've driven, uh, you know, the Russians out of so-and-so territory. Russia says we are going to capture and we've captured so much territory. So in some ways, uh, you know, people who think uh, Non-kinetic warfare will play a key, or cyber warfare will win wars for you. But some things have remained. Some things have remained kind of constant. So, from the point of view of uh, uh, defense purchase, the government's decision uh, to become, uh, you know, um, the Make in India or Atmanirbharata policy. Uh, how do you think uh, that has really helped? Look, uh, Mohan, we we needed to indigenize. I mean. Uh, the kind of uh, equipment we were purchasing, the dependency on you know specific countries like Russia, for example, I mean, dependent sixty percent on uh, on Russia for for defense equipment. That really was not good for the country. And secondly, one of the fact is uh, no country is going to part with cutting edge military technology to you. It's something that. You know, you have to you have to develop yourself. So I think it's good one that we started uh, a few years ago to diversify our our weapon imports, and now the government I think is very very serious about this. Atmanirbhar uh, self reliance in in defense industry. 
Uh, I know some people could uh, point out to the fact that, uh, you know, we are still the largest uh, defense importers in the world. The latest SIPRI report, which has looked at the last five years, says India is the number one uh, defense importer. Uh, but that's not because the government hasn't made an effort, but because we are starting, uh, you know, with an industrial, defense industrial base that is not really mature. The R&D is not there. But slowly, I think you will find that the efforts will bear fruit. And I'm hopeful in the next decade, uh, we will see significant improvement uh, in our ability to produce indigenous weapons systems. But let me just focus on another uh, so-called internal insurgency, uh, which is the, uh, the, 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 the northern, uh, northeastern states. Uh, now, Yesterday, I read that uh, nobody voted in uh, the Nagaland uh, uh, Lok Sabha uh, elections. Uh, we all know about uh, the fires in uh, uh, Manipur and the critics allege that uh, uh, the government has not taken uh, any action on Manipur. But at the same time, we also know that a lot of infrastructure development is going on uh, in the northeastern, particularly, you know, Arunachal Pradesh and so on. So how do you see this entire theater of northeastern states from India's security perspective? I would sum it up by saying it's just work in progress. And uh, outcomes, uh, we cannot judge by the outcomes which are evident to us at the moment. The outcomes will come our way uh, subsequently. There's a lot of work which has gone on to this. Starting with Arunachal, for example, uh, the infrastructure in, in, the, in those areas has, has really developed. And Development has reached the people. Um, the the armed forces capability of reaching up to the line of actual control is far far better tomorrow to, today than what it ever was. There are many more helipads. There are more tunnels. Uh, all that is there. Airfields, etc. Everything has come about in a in a much more revolutionized way. Event of a war, infrastructure can make all the difference. It helps you assert control. It improves connectivity to troops and hydropower project. It's the largest such project that India has ever commissioned. It was approved yesterday. This project will be built in the border state of Arunachal Pradesh. $3.9 billion will be invested for this. Yet, when you come for the south and in I can show you the same thing for Nagaland, maybe for Mizoram, everywhere. Development, I've visited all these areas recently. Development is evident. But uh, obviously, there is a political mismatch. Uh, there are aspirations, different aspirations of different ethnicities, uh, subgroups, etc. It's very difficult to match the aspirations with achievements. You may achieve something for a group, it will be at the cost of some other. That's happened in Nagaland and Manipur, between Nagaland mm -hmm. and Manipur to a very great extent. Manipur is, is a problem. There's no doubt Manipur is a problem. There's a transnational thing attached to it with the Myanmar border and across the Myanmar, uh, into the Myanmar territory, etc. There is a cross flow of ethnicity, of, of uh, ethnicity across the borders of different states. There are people from Manipur who are in Mizoram. There are people from Nagaland who are in Manipur. All this leads to lots and lots of aspirational things. It's not possible for a government at the center to satisfy every single element which is involved in this. And mm -hmm. uh, whatever we achieve, at least we have ensured that choice is there for the people to, to vote, to make their... Uh, to, Give, give uh, political strength to their representatives, etc. And uh, I think as we go along, more development takes place. Development in the Northeast is taking place at a fairly hectic rate. I'm sure these things will start receding more and more. Uh, and you worked in uh, Nagaland uh, uh, at the height of the Naga uh, insurgency. Uh, and uh, the recent reports suggest that uh, uh, in the uh, Lok Sabha election in the Nagaland constituency, um, hardly any votes were cast. Do you think the specter of uh, insurgency has uh, uh, reared its ugly head again in Nagaland? You know, Nagaland has been our longest running uh, insurgency in India. 
but after we've had ceasefire with uh, most of the Naga insurgent groups, uh, you know, as far as violence is concerned, you'll find there is hardly any violence. Uh, there was great hope after the 2015 Naga Peace Accord was signed between the government and the NSC and IM, which is the largest insurgent group there, uh, that you know we could come to some kind of political resolution. Uh, unfortunately. Uh, for many reasons, that has not happened. Uh, the 2015 Accord is yet to be implemented. But if you look at Nagaland today, the problem is not so much insurgency or violence. It's more uh, corruption, extortion, and people yearning for development. Okay. Uh, now, as a, a major general, you also uh, were responsible for counterinsurgency operations in uh, uh, Manipur, uh, and the fires have been burning in uh, Manipur uh, for quite some time now. Uh, what do you believe is the final solution um, or sustainable solution, so to say, uh, to the current crisis in Manipur? So, Mohan, frankly, when I look at the situation in Manipur, I'm, I'm completely shocked as, as an Indian citizen. Uh, I mean, the the state law and order machine has completely broken down. And I think that's the first step towards trying to, uh, at least in the short term, solve the problem in, in Manipur. Uh, the authority of the state has to be reestablished. You can't have vigilante armed groups roaming around the state, whether it is the, the Maitis or it is the Cookies. Uh, you know, establishing their own sort of law over the land, doing whatever they feel like doing. And it is not as if there is uh, insufficient military army or some rifles, police forces. So, as I said, I'm completely shocked. And after that, I think what you have to address is the fears of different ethnic groups. So, and everybody has a justification. So, the Maitis feel that they are being squeezed in the Nepal Valley. Uh, they don't have, uh, uh, you know, reservation for jobs, etc. Uh, the people in the hills, the Nagas and the and the Hukis can buy land in the Impal Valley, which is just ten percent of the population, where majority of the Metis reside. But the Metis cannot buy any land in the hills, so they feel they are getting more and more squeezed by people buying their buying land in the valley. So they have some, uh, you know, justification that needs to be addressed. The cookies sort of feel that we have already been uh, marginalized as a, as a scheduled tribe. And now if reservation is extended to the Metis, uh, this is going to further disempower us. So these are frankly fears of what is going to come in the future. And the government needs to sort of sit down with, uh, with these groups, talk to them and ensure that, you know, some of their genuine sort of grievances and problems are addressed. I'm not saying this is going to be a short-term quick fix, so it will take time. Uh, but at least get the armed vigilante groups off the streets and start talking to the stakeholders, which are the societies which are there. Mm -hmm. Now, elsewhere in the world, uh, defense forces have had a uh, real problem in attracting talent because it's not really seen in the current uh, contemporary context as a attractive career as it used to be once upon a time. Even in India, uh, South Indians wouldn't really look at army career as a coveted career as the North Indians would, right? So uh, uh, from the point of view of attraction of talent, uh, how do you see the current situation? Is it We have a deficiency in the armed forces in terms of officers. The army, for example, has a huge deficiency of almost about ten to 11,000 officers. And one of the reasons for it is we have never compromised on our standards. Uh, at the services selection board level, where uh, after the writing of the UPSC exam, you'll find a person coming up for interviews and group testing, psychological tests, etc. We could have compromised with our standards and brought in 10,000 people over a period of time. The typical model of intake. But we have sort of denied ourselves that so we said we will not compromise and today we are still functioning on a on a fairly large deficiency but i think a time will come when the army will have to do but despite that the people that we are taking in at the moment i'm not dissatisfied with them in, in any way 
I, I think we uh, we are getting a good stock of people. Today, many, many more options in terms of job opportunities are available to people. Uh, and uh, a lot of them are opting for it. So what you said is right. There is a, uh, there is a bit of an issue with regard to uh, attracting the right kind of uh, talent into the into the military. Uh, so various steps are being done, and I think we've opened it up now uh, also to uh, women, which to some extent is going to overcome this uh, overcome this uh, problem. So while the problem of attracting talent remains, I think retention is not an issue. You really don't see uh, people who have joined the services. You don't see a very large number of them wanting to leave. It's a it's a good good life. Uh, it's an attractive life. Uh, lots of positives about you know comradeship, brotherhood. Uh, even even facilities are good. So in fact, uh, uh, we have a short service commission, but uh, uh, a lot of People who are in short service actually don't want to leave and say, give us a permanent commission. Uh, we saw that even among the women officers, you know, went to the Supreme Court that why are women officers being only taken for short service and that we want uh, permanent uh, retention in the, in the military. So, yes, as I said, uh, attracting talent is a bit of a challenge, but retention is not. There are not too many people who want to leave once they've seen the military life. When we talk about recruitment and selection, uh, you know that's that's quite uh, different uh, as compared to the uh, uh, you know uh, the, the 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 lower level as compared to the higher level. Uh, now, at, at at the lower end of the defense forces uh, in India, historically there has always been intense competition to uh, join the defense forces, whether you call it economic. Uh, 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 compulsion or uh, nationalism, uh, whatever it is. But with the introduction of the Agnivir scheme, do you think that uh, dynamics is uh, likely to change? And how do you see Agnivir uh, fulfilling the defense uh, manpower needs going forward? So, you know, uh, Agnivir, uh, as you know, the, the scheme uh, has its backers and its critics uh, in India. There are two views towards the other. I don't want to get involved in, in that debate, but just uh, in terms of what you're saying. So there would be thousands and thousands of people who would turn up for rallies. Uh, and they saw the military as a very sort of respectable job. Uh, respectable not only uh, in, in that they were joining and putting on the uniform but also the kind of respect that they would get when they go back to their villages, etc. Uh, people who were retiring and going back and settling in their villages were also treated with great respect. Uh, so that was the sort of uh, sense. Now with the ugly weeds coming in, uh, you know, only I think first two or three batches have got commissioned. But I was reading some reports that indicate that now uh, the same people who would sort of opt for a military career are now preferring to go into the police or the central armed police forces because they see that as being more stable than uh, a four-year career in the army after which 75% of them uh, would leave. So I think we are going to see the uh, the impact of the Agni Veer in the coming years, both outside and within the military. There are questions of whether standards are adequate because training periods have reduced, whether uh, soldiers coming only for four years will retain the same ethos and values that regular army soldiers have. Uh, I think in the next three or four years is where we will see the impact. I think the good thing is that although the scheme has been promulgated, uh, the government has said that it is open to reviewing it. And it's it's my own feeling, Mohan, as we go forward, uh, the scheme as it sort of sounds 75, 25, uh, I think we'll see a lot of review in the coming years based on the lessons that we learned. And uh, that is that, you know, 
Indians watched in dismay uh, when there was no concrete action taken uh, after the attack on the Indian parliament. Uh, also, during the Mumbai terror attacks, people witnessed live on the TV screen how the rapid action forces really struggled to even reach the hotspot. So from those kind of helpless situation, uh, you know, when when we saw the surgical strike against Pakistan in 2016 uh, and so on, you know, that is a big contrast. So no matter what critics say, one thing that everybody has to agree is that under the present government, uh, you know, uh, India is seen as a powerful country which cannot be messed around with. So from the perspective of the army, do you see that 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 quantum jump in confidence and capability? Uh, absolutely. So it isn't as if uh, Mohan said the army was not professional before or was not capable of doing it. Uh, it was just that uh, had to follow, obviously, you know, government and political direction. And what you are saying is uh, is completely right that under the under the present government, you have seen a shift in attitude. You have shift seen a shift in policy on how we would respond to terrorist attacks. And I think in no uncertain terms, they have made it clear that we are not going to sit back idly if you continue to use proxies, continue to use terrorists against us, and that we are not going to respond. So not only are we willing to respond, but we are also willing to accept escalation to a certain extent. So there is a, there is a much greater risk-taking appetite in the government. And I think obviously that translates also into how the military operates and, and what they do. So, uh, I mean, absolutely no doubt that there is a, there is a certain change in the current government's policy. Okay. And then finally, with so many geopolitical tensions all around us, how safe and secure uh, Indians should feel from uh, uh, you know, a security uh, perspective? I think, I think we should feel safe and secure, uh, at least from, from external threats. Uh, I think uh, the, Indian, the Indian military, uh, India's diplomacy uh, has done enough to secure India from you know, what are traditional rivals uh, China and Pakistan are, and uh, Indians should feel should feel safe about it. Where I worry, uh, uh, Mohan, is uh, our own sort of internal divisions, you know, the social media, fake news, divisive narratives, and, and some of that, I think, is something that should concern us and say, uh, look, we are a very plural kind of society, and uh, we should find, you know, ways, best ways to uh, to live in harmony sort of with each other. Uh, social media is really creating, uh, you know, a, a lot of, a lot of issues. Uh, and now you have deep fakes and, uh, you know, the way technology is, is resonating. So I, I think that's something that, uh, it's new, but that's something I think we need to, and we have to come to grips with.